President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. of the Philippines has affirmed the nation's commitment to asserting its rights in the South China Sea, despite warnings from China. Marcos, addressing the military, stated that the Philippines remains a force and voice of reason amid provocations and exemplifies responsible behavior in accordance with international law. Tensions between China and the Philippines have risen, marked by clashes in the South China Sea. Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi warned against collaboration with external forces, while Marcos highlighted recent incidents, including the ramming of a Philippine boat by a Chinese vessel. The Philippines plans multilateral patrols with countries like France, India, Canada, and the UK, with a potential access agreement with Japan in 2024, according to Defense Secretary Gilberto Teodoro. The chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs held a conversation with his Chinese counterpart, marking the first high-level military dialogue between the two nations since July 2022, when military contacts were severed following Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. The call is seen as a sign of normalization in military ties, especially after President Joe Biden's meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping in November. While military communication is resuming, other areas continue to strain U.S.-China relations. The Wall Street Journal suggests the countries are attempting to sustain positive momentum after a period of fractured ties, during which China engaged in over 180 maneuvers and intercepts described as risky and coercive behavior by Pentagon officials. The communication is considered crucial for deconfliction, particularly in the South China Sea, where China has become more assertive with Philippine vessels. NYU professor Scott Galloway predicts a thaw in U.S.-China relations in 2024 due to economic concerns, but other factors, such as competition over TikTok, Taiwan, and semiconductor chips, could complicate reconciliation. President Biden is reportedly considering tariffs on Chinese goods, signaling toughness on China. Additionally, reports suggest China is developing the capability to test nuclear weapons, though experts speculate on whether China will wait to observe actions by other nuclear powers before conducting its own tests. U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo stated that there is no perceived change in China's stance on Taiwan, refuting recent media reports suggesting that Chinese President Xi Jinping informed President Joe Biden during a summit in San Francisco about plans to reunify Taiwan with mainland China without specifying the timing. Raimondo, who was present at the meeting, emphasized that President Xi's remarks were consistent with previous statements and that the discussion between the two leaders was positive and direct. Despite tensions over Taiwan, Biden and Xi made progress during their meeting, agreeing to establish a presidential hotline and resume military communications. She urged the U. S. to cease weapon shipments to Taiwan, advocating for China's peaceful reunification, while Biden emphasized the importance of peace in the Taiwan Strait and called Xi a dictator in a post-summit press briefing. The U.S. remains a key supporter and arms supplier to Taiwan, despite not formally recognizing its government and maintaining official relations with Beijing. Japan's cabinet has approved a record military budget of 7.95 trillion yen, $56 billion, for the 2024 fiscal year, representing a more than 16% increase and marking the second year of a five-year military build-up program. The budget includes plans to accelerate the deployment of long-range cruise missiles capable of targeting China or North Korea, fortify the military with F-35 stealth combat jets, and enhance overall strike capability. Japan aims to spend a total of 43 trillion yen, $300 billion, by 2027, nearly doubling annual military spending to around 10 trillion yen, $68 billion, making it the world's third-largest military spender after the United States and China. The focus of the 2024 budget is the early deployment of standoff missiles to reinforce air defenses. With significant allocations for Type 12 cruise missiles, U.S.-made Tomahawks, and the development of next-generation long-range missiles. The budget also addresses missile defense systems, construction of Aegis-equipped warships, joint development of glide phase interceptors with the United States, and the development of a next-generation fighter jet in collaboration with Britain and Italy. Additionally, the budget includes subsidies to strengthen Japan's defense industry and support foreign arms sales. The budget plan requires parliamentary approval in early 2024. Hong Kong's court has rejected a plea by activist publisher Jimmy Lai to dismiss a sedition charge against him on the third day of his national security trial. Lai, 76, was arrested during the 2019 crackdown on dissidents, facing potential life imprisonment under Beijing's national security law. 
The charge accuses him of colluding with foreign forces and conspiring to publish seditious materials. The trial, closely watched by foreign governments and legal experts, is linked to the now-closed pro-democracy newspaper Apple Daily that Lai founded. The judges ruled that the prosecution met the time limit for filing the sedition charge. Hong Kong's freedoms and judicial independence are seen as being tested in this landmark case. Amid a broader erosion of civil liberties since the introduction of the security law in the former British colony. The trial is expected to last about 80 days without a jury. Lai's prosecution has drawn criticism from the US and the UK, while Beijing has called such comments irresponsible. Hong Kong's media freedom ranking has sharply declined since the imposition of the security law in 2020. Amnesty International accuses the Myanmar military of indiscriminate killings, civilian detentions, and the use of airdropped cluster munitions in response to an insurgency by the Three Brotherhood Alliance in the northeast and west. The alliance, comprising the Arakan Army, the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, and the Tang National Liberation Army, launched an offensive in October, posing a significant challenge to the military. Amnesty demands an investigation into potential war crimes, citing a nighttime airstrike with likely banned cluster munitions on Namkum Township and indiscriminate attacks on civilians in Rakhine's Pokta Township. Human Rights Watch also reports the forced recruitment of fleeing civilians by the Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army in Shan. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs notes 378 civilian deaths and over 660,000 displaced since October with over 2.6 million displaced nationwide since the military seized power in 2021. As North African countries witness diminishing support for Western powers due to protests related to the Israel-Hamas conflict, Russia is expanding its presence in the region. Large billboards advertising Russia today have appeared in Tunisia, indicating Moscow's efforts to strengthen ties amid declining Western popularity. Arab barometer data reveals a 30% drop in the U.S.'s popularity in the weeks after the Israel-Hamas war, prompting Russia to strengthen its narrative and ties in North Africa. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov visited Marrakesh and Tunis, expressing interest in energy and agriculture trade and highlighting Russia's contrasting positions with the U.S. in the Middle East. The Arab-Russian Cooperation Forum provided a platform for Russia to align itself with Arab countries ahead of a U.N. vote on an Arab-backed resolution for Gaza. North African countries, traditionally aligned with the US and NATO, are attempting to project neutrality and maintain trade and political ties with Russia, leveraging frustration with Western powers in Moscow's favor. The region is crucial for both Europe and Russia in terms of trade, and Moscow's posture aligns with its global agenda to assert itself as a great power. The European Union has delivered the final tranche of its multi-billion euro support package to Ukraine to aid its economy providing 1.5 billion euros, 1.6 billion dollars, each month in 2023 for stability, infrastructure rebuilding, wage and pension payments, and other essential services. However, this support concludes this year, leaving Ukraine without a financial lifeline from Europe starting next month. The European Commission proposed a longer-term package of 50 billion euros, 55 billion dollars, which was endorsed by 26 out of 27 EU nations, but Hungary vetoed it. Prime Minister Viktor Orban, a close ally of Russian President Putin, opposed further funding, accusing EU partners of prolonging the war. Orban is expected to meet with EU leaders on February 1 to address the deadlock. The proposed €50 billion Euro package is part of the EU's revised long-term budget, and discussions about potential financial support for Ukraine beyond 2023 are ongoing. The EU has provided nearly 85 billion euros, 93 billion dollars, in various forms of support to Ukraine since Russia's invasion in February 2022. Ukraine's parliament has voted to legalize medical marijuana, a move aimed at addressing the rising cases of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, among people affected by the war with Russia. The new law, set to take effect in six months, also permits the use of cannabis for scientific and industrial purposes. Proposed by Prime Minister Denis Smyhal, the legislation received 248 votes in the 401-seat parliament in Kiev. While supporters highlight the potential benefits of medical marijuana, concerns about potential abuse and increased drug presence in cities have been raised. The strict controls outlined in the law mandate a doctor's prescription for obtaining cannabis-based medicines, with recreational use remaining a criminal offense. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban stated during a press conference in Budapest that the Russian invasion of Ukraine should not be considered a war. 
Hungary, in contrast to many European nations, has maintained close ties with Russia and opposed sanctions against Moscow. Orban referred to the invasion as a military operation, aligning with the Kremlin's terminology. He mentioned accepting President Zelensky's invitation for a meeting and had previously met with Russian President Putin in October. At the EU Council summit, Orban abstained from the vote on accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova, asserting that EU membership for Ukraine is a bad decision. He also blocked a 50 billion euro EU package for Ukraine, claiming it's financially burdensome for the EU. Orban accused the EU of blackmail and defended Hungary's adherence to the rule of law, denying collaboration with Turkey on Sweden's NATO membership. Orban stated that Hungary's parliament will decide when the time is right. Both Sweden and Finland applied to join NATO after Russia's invasion, with Finland gaining membership in March 2023. Turkey delayed voting on Sweden's accession, echoing Hungary's stance that there's no rush. The Biden administration is reportedly considering seizing over $300 billion in Russian central bank assets held in Western nations to support Ukraine's war effort. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who previously deemed such action legally impermissible without Congress, is now re-evaluating the possibility. Discussions with G7 allies are underway to explore existing authorities or seek congressional approval for using the frozen funds, with a target strategy deadline of February 24. The funds, frozen for over a year due to sanctions, could be utilized to aid Ukraine, but details, including how the money will be used, remain under discussion. Seizing such a substantial sum from another country is unprecedented and may lead to legal and economic consequences, including retaliation from Russia. The urgency arises as Congress failed to reach a deal on military aid, prompting the administration to seek alternative funding sources. The debate involves considering direct use of funds, guaranteeing loans, or utilizing interest income for Ukraine. Despite potential legal challenges, proponents argue that seizing Russia's assets is justified given the gravity of its actions. Turkish warplanes conducted new airstrikes in northern Iraq against suspected Kurdish militant targets, following high-level security talks between Turkish and Iraqi officials in Ankara. Turkey, which frequently targets sites associated with the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, a banned Kurdish separatist group, launched strikes in the Gara, Haykork, and Kandil regions. The Turkish Defense Ministry reported hitting 14 PKK targets, including caves, shelters, and warehouses, with precautions taken to avoid harm to civilians, cultural heritage, and the environment. The PKK, the Iraqi government, and the northern Kurdish region authorities have not yet commented on the airstrikes. The PKK is designated a terrorist organization by the United States and the European Union, and the conflict with Turkey has resulted in tens of thousands of deaths since 1984. The main opposition group in Serbia, Serbia Against Violence, has called on the European Union EU, to support an international investigation into reported irregularities during the recent parliamentary and local elections. The opposition refuses to recognize the election outcome and accuses the EU of overlooking democratic deficiencies in exchange for regional stability. Alleged irregularities include media bias, false signatures on voter lists, vote buying, and voter migration, with claims that people were brought in from Bosnia to vote in Belgrade. The opposition demands the annulment and rerun of the elections, while a preliminary international observation mission reported multiple irregularities. The EU has not yet responded to the opposition's call for an investigation. The Israeli government has indicated its willingness to allow the Palestinian Authority, PA, to govern the Gaza Strip after the cessation of military operations against Hamas. Previously, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu opposed the PA's return to Gaza, citing corruption and failure to condemn Hamas's recent terrorist attack. However, in an editorial, Israel's national security advisor outlined a shift in position, emphasizing the need for a moderate Palestinian governing body with international support. The PA was pushed out of Gaza by Hamas in 2006, and the Biden administration seeks reunification of the West Bank and Gaza under a revitalized PA for post-war negotiations. Questions remain about the leadership in Gaza and efforts to lend legitimacy to the PA among Palestinians. The PA has engaged in discussions with Hamas in Qatar about post-war leadership in Gaza, with potential joint leadership structures suggested. Israel and the U.S. rule out Hamas playing a future leadership role, and efforts are underway to identify new leaders to replace Mahmoud Abbas.
Abbas has expressed readiness for reforms and supporting Gaza's reconstruction contingent on progress in the peace process. A wartime poll showed 72% of respondents in the West Bank and Gaza supporting Hamas's recent attack on Israel. The United States is prepared to vote on a United Nations Security Council resolution regarding Gaza after multiple delays. The resolution calls for a suspension of fighting between Israel and Hamas and an increase in humanitarian aid to Gaza. The vote, initially expected to occur on Thursday, was postponed and is now anticipated on Friday. The U.S., as one of the Security Council's permanent members, holds the power to veto the resolution, but U.S. Ambassador to the UN Linda Thomas-Greenfield indicated the U.S. is ready to support the measure. The resolution aims to facilitate humanitarian assistance and establish a monitoring mechanism on the ground, supporting Egypt's priorities. The U.S. had expressed concerns about potential delays in aid delivery due to a UN-created monitoring mechanism. The resolution's language and the issue of a cessation of hostilities are central to negotiations. President Joe Biden has been involved in discussions surrounding the resolution, and U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby highlighted the importance of addressing the humanitarian situation in Gaza. Previous delays were attributed to U.S. reticence to sign on to a resolution seen as a rebuke to Israel's military campaign. The mounting civilian death toll in Gaza has prompted U.S. officials to urge Israel to take more significant steps to protect innocent lives. The Security Council resolution is binding, unlike the non-binding General Assembly vote, where the U.S. has previously blocked ceasefire calls. Hamas has ruled out any more hostage releases until Israel agrees to a full cessation of aggression. Israel claims to have killed over 2,000 Hamas fighters in Gaza since a truce earlier this month when more than 100 hostages were freed. Around 120 people abducted from Israel on October 7 are believed to be still in captivity in Gaza. Negotiations on a new truce have been taking place in Cairo, Egypt, though initial talks on Wednesday bore no agreement. Hamas is pressuring Israel to stop the war altogether, but Israel is reluctant to cease fighting until it believes it has completely degraded Hamas's capability. The United Nations Security Council resolution on the conflict has faced delays, with the U.S. expressing serious concerns over the draft resolution. Fighting continues in Gaza, with Israel bombarding the north and south of the territory, and Hamas firing rockets at Tel Aviv. Abdul Malik al Houthi, the leader of Yemen's Iran backed Houthi rebels, has warned that any American targeting of Yemen will be met with retaliation, as the U.S. leads a multinational effort to protect commercial ships from Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. The threat follows the launch of Operation Prosperity Guardian, involving the U.S., the U.K., Bahrain, Canada, France, Italy, Netherlands, Norway, Seychelles, and Spain. Greece has also announced its participation, sending a naval frigate to join the operation. The Houthi leader's statement comes amid escalating tensions and recent Houthi attacks originating from Yemen. Iran's foreign ministry summoned the German ambassador to Tehran in protest against a German court's ruling that implicated Iran in a plan to attack a synagogue in Germany. The Dusseldorf State Court convicted a German-Iranian man of attempted arson and sentenced him to two years and nine months in prison for throwing an incendiary device at a school near a synagogue. The court concluded that the attack plan originated from an Iranian state institution, allegedly orchestrated by a former Hells Angels member in Iran. Iran rejected the ruling as a baseless accusation. In response, the German foreign ministry summoned the Iranian charged affair, a move condemned by Tehran. Additionally, the Iranian foreign ministry summoned the Swedish charged affair over a Swedish appeals court's endorsement of a life sentence for Hamid Nauri for war crimes and murder during the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. Nauri, arrested in 2019, appealed the ruling but was unsuccessful. Australia will send 11 military personnel to support a US-led mission aimed at protecting cargo shipping in the Red Sea. However, Defence Minister Richard Murley stated that Australia won't deploy a warship or plane for this mission, emphasising the need to maintain focus on the Pacific region. The US-led mission is a response to concerns about attacks by drones and ballistic missiles from Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen. Murley's rejected criticism that not sending a warship made Australia a less reliable ally, arguing that Australia's strategic focus is on the Asia-Pacific region. Opposition lawmakers called for Australia to contribute a warship to the mission. The move comes amid growing concerns about China's assertiveness in the region. Canada's immigration minister, Mark Miller, announced that people in the Gaza Strip with Canadian relatives may apply for temporary visas to Canada. 
The program is expected to be operational by January 9th, and applications will be accepted for individuals with extended family connections to Canada, such as parents, grandparents, siblings, and grandchildren. Three-year visas will be offered to those meeting eligibility and admissibility criteria. However, Miller clarified that the Canadian government cannot guarantee safe passage out of Gaza. The program is part of the ongoing efforts to assist Canadians and their families amid challenges in evacuating them from the besieged Palestinian territory. Miller acknowledged the difficulty in facilitating evacuations, citing limited capabilities.